It seems to me that if we're ever going to find a cure for multiple sclerosis, the scientists need to concern themselves not just with observing what is happening, but understanding how it's happening. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for almost 40 years. I just came upon an article that I want to share with you, but before we do, I'd like to just talk a bit about the difference between basic research and applied research because that matters a lot in any field of study. We get impatient and we just want them to get the medicines out there, but we don't always understand. There's a lot of basic research that has to happen before they're ready to start trying to turn things into pharmaceutical products or other treatment options for us. To explain the difference between basic and applied research, a very oversimplified way to think about it is the difference between a scientist and an engineer and what they tend to do. A scientist would, for example, develop the periodic table of the chemical elements that you probably studied in school, but an engineer would take the knowledge that's gained from understanding properties of materials based on that periodic table, and they would select the materials that they want to use to make, for example, a bridge. In the same way, the medical community needs to do more than understand the mechanisms that drive multiple sclerosis, that drive demyelination. They need to understand how those mechanisms actually work before they can turn their knowledge into some kind of a therapy for us. So for that reason, before I show you the article, I'd like to play a video that describes how oligodendrocytes actually work in the body. Yes. Oligodendrocyte. The word is long and kind of silly, but we'd be pretty useless without them. Oligodendrocytes are among the last cells to form in your brain. They produce proteins that are important for strong, healthy neurons, like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, and insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1. These proteins help new neurons grow and form synapses, as well as supporting existing neurons and keeping them healthy. Oligodendrocytes also have very special lipid membranes, and they use them to form the myelin sheath around neurons. This process is called myelination. Myelination isn't a fast process. At birth, there are very few brain regions with much myelination, and the process continues until you're in your 20s. Myelin was named by the German pathologist Rudolf Virchow from the Greek word mylos, meaning marrow, because when he first saw it, he thought it was actually inside the neurons. Since its discovery, we've discovered that myelin is actually wrapped around the neurons, and this makes it really useful. Why? Well, as we've discussed, neurons use electrical signals to communicate with each other, and for us to function normally, in real time, those signals have to be sent across some pretty long distances, like from the base of your spine to the tip of your toe, and it has to be done quickly. But physics puts some limitations on how quickly neurons can send their signals. The velocity of the signal depends on the diameter of the axon. The thicker the axon, the faster the signal. But we have way too many brain cells for our axons to be really thick. Our heads would be huge. So vertebrates evolved myelin to get around the problem. It keeps the ions close to the cell membrane so they can't escape, preserving the strength of the signal as it travels down the line. And there are gaps in the myelin sheath, called nodes of Ranvier, where ion channels are clustered so the signal can be maintained and amplified. This setup basically lets the electrical signal jump from node to node, so the message can move very quickly. And this is called saltatory conduction. So myelin and Therefore, oligodendrocytes are a really important part of what makes our human brain so special. Oligodendrocytes are actually a part of the central nervous system. This means that they're only found in the brain and spinal cord. Myelination in the peripheral nervous system, the rest of the nerves in your body, is taken care of by Schwann cells. And because myelin is so crucial for normal signaling in the brain and body, 
When something causes the myelin to break down, things can get pretty bad. Loss of myelin is part of the reason that things like strokes and spinal cord injuries can be so difficult to recover from. It's also a huge part of the disease multiple sclerosis, or MS. Researchers are trying to understand what causes MS, and the best theory we have so far is that it's actually an autoimmune disorder. Basically, our immune cells get confused, and instead of just attacking intruders, they start attacking the myelin sheath. Once the sheath gets damaged, the nerves are left exposed, and the brain can't signal properly to the muscles. This leads to all kinds of dysfunction, like weakness, numbness, and even paralysis. Scientists think that if we can figure out ways to protect or regenerate the myelin sheath, we can help stop and even reverse the symptoms of MS, which could be a huge help for people struggling with the disease in the future. And here's another interesting video I found. It's very short. It shows the different stages of a person's life where the myelin forms beginning in childhood and going into your 20s. At 16 weeks, myelination begins in the lower spinal cord and proceeds to the upper spinal cord, brainstem, cerebellum, and posterior part of the internal capsule. All of these structures show myelination at the time of birth. Myelination extends to other areas of the brain and in fact continues for many years after birth. The process of myelination is largely complete by the third birthday, but it continues at a much lesser pace into early adolescence and beyond, even to the late 20s. Now let's talk Okay, now finally, I think we're ready to look together at this article. Adult myelin-making cells display unique marker affecting activity. Differences seen in neonatal and adult cells may aid remyelination therapies. And this was published in Multiple Sclerosis News Today on August 16th, 2024. But as you can see, the investigators had already published a press release on August 12th of 2024 in Neuroscience Initiatives. And that article, which is quite a bit more technical than the one we're about to read, is called Adult Oligodendrocyte Progenitor Cell Study Opens Doors for Advanced Myelin Repair Therapies. So I'm going to link this below, even though, as I said, it's a little more technical and it doesn't even really seem to have quite as much detail to it as the one that we are going to read. But it's important to know that this research is coming out of the Advanced Science Research Center at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. As I looked into it, I found that they are quite active in this area. So the first time it's really crossed my desk to see this organization, but more power to them. I'm really glad they're working on this. But back to the article, it says a specific epigenetic marker or a chemical modification in DNA that alters gene activity may explain why adult oligodendrocyte progenitor cells respond differently to therapies aiming to restore myelin than their neonatal counterparts, a study reports. The modification, called a lysine 8 acetylation on histone H4, <laughs> you can see why the other paper gets very technical very fast, helps to regulate the activity of these myelin-making cells in the adult brain. This finding holds promise for developing more effective therapies for conditions characterized by myelin damage like multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, and several psychiatric disorders, Patrizia Casaccia, MD, PhD, the study's principal investigator and director of the Neuroscience Initiative at the City University of New York said in the university news release. The study, histone H4 acetylation, differentially modulates proliferation in adult oligodendrocyte progenitors, was published in the Journal of Cell Biology. And they say that inflammation in MS damages the myelin sheath and nerve cell signaling. And we know this, of course, only too well. Multiple sclerosis is due to inflammation in the brain that damages the myelin sheath, 
a fatty covering that wraps around nerve fibers and helps them send electrical signals, a bit like rubber insulation around a metal wire. Damage to myelin disrupts nerve signaling, ultimately driving disease symptoms. One of the main goals of modern MS research is finding treatments that can help repair or replace damaged myelin. Within the brain, myelin is made primarily by cells called oligodendrocytes. When myelin is damaged, immature cells called oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, or OPCs, can spring into action, growing into mature oligodendrocytes to repair myelin. This remyelination process is impaired in MS, though the reasons aren't fully clear. In addition to helping repair damaged myelin in adults, Oligodendrocytes and OPCs are essential for making myelin during neonatal development. Both neonatal and adult OPCs share many characteristics, but they also have notable differences in their biological activity. Researchers with CUNY conducted a battery of molecular experiments aiming to understand reasons for these differences. By focusing on adult OPCs, we can move closer to repairing myelin damage and improving patient outcomes, Kasachia said. Specifically, they focused on epigenetic changes within the cells. Epigenetics refers to chemical modifications to DNA molecules that don't alter the genetic code itself, but influence how specific genes are turned on and off, substantially impacting the activity of cells. Recent results showed that, compared with their neonatal counterparts, Adult OPCs carry substantially higher levels of an epigenetic modification called lysine 8 acetylation on histone H4. Histones are proteins that help to keep DNA molecules in place. Strands of DNA wrap around histones sort of like thread wraps around a spool. In this modification, a particular type of histone, H4, undergoes a chemical modification called acetylation at a particular site known as lysine 8. The identification of this histone tag provides a clearer understanding of OPC proliferation in the adult brain, Kasachia said. This modification was particularly abundant close to several genes that are known to be important for the activity of OPCs, and the researchers demonstrated that this modification is essential for regulating the activity of adult OPCs. The importance is put on targeting adult-specific cell mechanisms in research. When the cells were treated with chemicals to block the modification, their ability to proliferate and grow into more OPCs was impaired. The same chemical treatment didn't substantially alter the growth of neonatal OPCs, lending further credence to the idea that this modification is specific to adult cells. These data identify lysine 8 acetylation on histone H4 as important for the identity and proliferation of adult oligodendrocyte precursor cells, the researchers concluded. Findings also underscore the importance of targeting adult specific cellular mechanisms in neotherapeutic research, said David K. Dansu, PhD, a former doctoral student in CUNY, working as a postdoctoral fellow at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Researchers now plan to explore the effects of this modification on cellular activity and its implications for potential treatment strategies to promote myelin repair. Our future investigations will aim to further elucidate the role of lysine 8 acetylation on histone H4 and explore its potential in clinical applications, said IPEC Celsen a doctoral student at CUNY. Okay, well, my takeaway from this then is that something happens once we're born because the myelination process seems to proceed very nicely and smoothly in young people. But as we get older, either the mechanism itself starts to turn off just because that's what it's designed to do, or we start accumulating maybe environmental damage or some other thing is going on that is interfering with the natural creation of myelin that was so easy to do when we were young. I don't know, but you know, this to me is a pretty fascinating development.
Well, I hope you see from this that this is another exciting frontier. I'm pretty excited that they're going to be looking at how myelin actually is made in the body. If we don't understand how it's made, I guess understanding how it gets unmade is only half the puzzle. And for us to think about remyelination, it's good to understand the mechanisms by which myelin is made in the body in the first place, totally naturally, without us even having to think about it. I actually kind of find these mechanisms pretty amazing. I hope you agree. The body is an amazing thing. We only really notice when it doesn't work right, but most of the time it works so well that we don't tend to look under the hood very often. So I like it when we actually have to look under the hood. I just always marvel at the body and all of the things that it does. And now that we are armed with this knowledge, the medicines and therapies that they're going to be developing in the future are bound to be better, and the knowledge will move us closer to finding a cure for multiple sclerosis at long last. But that's all I have for you today, so until my next video, please do take really good care of yourself.